Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Thank you. Brenda said, uh, be careful, you know, be glad you're not going to be on the video table. Some of you may be very upset that you're not going to be on the video. So <laughs> if anybody wants to run up and do a little dance or whatever, you can, you can do, we'll let you do that today. But I would uh, like to tell you a little bit before we get into the meat of the information, a little bit about me and what to expect for today. And we have some very important business to speak about. We have an evaluation form that's in your handout that you got. It's the first page in your handout, and we ask you to fill out that evaluation form. And you'll hand that in at the end of today. And in exchange for you being here, for your signature, and for your filling out the evaluation form, we will give you the prize of today, which is the certificate of attendance that you can use for continuing ed credits. So that's the most important business. Now we get to such less important business, but still have to tell you. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about me so you know who your presenter is. You see, I have some letters after my name, CISW. What is that? It's Certified Independent Social Worker, which means I have a master's in social work, and I'm certified in the state of Arizona to practice independently. The ICADC is an international certification in alcohol and drug addiction counseling. I also have a BCETS. I mean, don't you just love all the letters? Nobody knows what they mean anyway, but you know, you can just put, keep putting them after your name. So BCETS is Board Certified Expert in Traumatic Stress from the American Academy of Experts in Traumatic Stress, which is a very powerful interdisciplinary or, uh, organization um, for people who work with all forms of traumatic stress. And if anybody's interested in getting more information about the Academy, come on and see me and I'll talk to you a little bit about it. There's also a reference for the Academy in your handout. I am a certified Imago relationship therapist. How many people have heard of Imago, I-M-A-G-O? Anybody? A few people, great. Well, hopefully by 11.45 this morning, and if not 11.45, then by 1.15. All of you will have heard of Imago, and you will have a 15-minute on-the-road running understanding of what it is and how it fits in with our work around childhood sexual abuse. I'm a student of psychodrama. Oftentimes, we don't call it psychodrama. How come? Because people get really freaked out. Psychodrama, what does that mean? Okay, so it's action methods. So I'm a student of action methods, and I use a lot of action methods in the work that I do with clients. And because of that, that work, and I've been in psychodrama training for about 13 years now and continue to do training. Because of that work and some of my 12-step experience, I've really come to believe that oftentimes people need to act their way into new thinking and feeling instead of us trying to get them to think and feel different so that they do it different. Does that make any sense to you at all? Okay, I want to give you an example of that. I do some consulting and I run uh, experiential groups for a women's treatment, eating disorder treatment center in Tucson called Mirasol. And again, if anybody is interested in eating disorder inpatient treatment, come and see me and I'd be happy to talk to you about Mirasol. I think it's a great program. It's a great program because I wrote the sexuality piece of the program, so it has to be a great program. So I'm running this group and, it, and the woman I'm working with is talking about how bad she feels about herself and one of her signs and symptoms is her low self-esteem and her self-loathing and and we worked with her, and she, in the experiential work, she practiced setting some boundaries. She practiced raising her voice to about this level and practiced saying, I feel angry, which she had never done before. She had cried when she felt angry. She had whined when she felt angry. But she was not able to directly, firmly state Standing up tall, I feel angry in a powerful voice. It was too scary for her. So I talk about acting as if. I talk about practicing. And I really see the therapeutic relationship and the physical space that we use, the office, the group room, whatever, 
as hopefully a safe laboratory for people to try on new ways of thinking, feeling, and believing and behaving. And so my thing is always about willingness. And I asked her, would you be willing? I really hear you feel like yuck about you. Would you be willing to act as if and practice, match my sound, I feel angry, and set this boundary and kind of coached her? And she did. And what happened? After the work, she was able to, her body posture was different. Okay. She was able to report that the tightness in her chest was a lot less, that she felt better about herself. And my experience professionally has said that when people do esteemable acts, their self-esteem goes up. So if I would wait for her to feel good about herself to set a boundary, it would never happen. Does that help clarify what I'm trying to say? Okay. So that's why action, one of the pieces why action methods work so well. We call it role training. We're teaching people how to do a new role. Assertive, for example. Okay, because you can talk about all you want, but if you're not doing it, the learning doesn't get locked in. And that's going to be related to a really important concept today about learning and what the most powerful forms of learning are. And I'm going to just put that on the shelf there because we're going to talk about that. So psychodrama. I am not a certified psychodramatist yet because it takes a minimum of 780 training hours before you can sit for the written exam. So I've just accepted this is a lifelong journey for me. And then I have 12-step uh, philosophy, 12-step of Alcoholics Anonymous and related programs. And that does not mean I send everybody to a 12-step meeting. It means that I have a bottom line philosophy, which is a spiritual philosophy. And if you looked at the outline when you got the brochure, one of the things we're going to talk about today is the importance of spirituality and recovery. And <clears throat> I really believe that if we don't integrate that into mental health, substance abuse counseling, okay, or therapy, that we are really neglecting the whole of the person. And we are, we are colluding with them to dissociate and separate out parts of themselves. And so it's a real comprehensive model that you'll hear more about today. Last thing about me that's important is personally, I identify as a thriver with a child sexual abuse history. And you're going to hear the difference between survivor and thriver today. And the reason that I share with you that I have a child sexual abuse history is because I'm going to talk about some of my personal story today. And the only reason that I do that is to give you concrete examples of some of the concepts and ideas that I'd like you to walk away with at 3.45, 3.30, 3.45 this afternoon. I know and hold true that this is a professional training seminar. This is not a personal therapy workshop. Okay? We are not in the nice social work circle where we'll be sharing our feelings today. Okay? You're in rows. You know? People are here with their professional hats on, right? Yes? Okay. Now. My experience doing this seminar seven and a half years now, all over the country, average of 80 people a seminar, okay? there's a percentage of you today who are wearing more than one hat. There's a percentage of you today who are here professionally as well as because personally you've been touched by childhood sexual abuse in some way, shape, or form. And so what I'm going to ask you to do if you're one of those people like me is that you take care of yourself today. Because you can already tell I am not originally from Tucson, Arizona. Can you tell that? <laughs> OK. So there are two definites that you're going to get about Adina from Long Island, New York. One, she speaks fast. Okay. Two, she's got a sarcastic sense of humor. All right. So that doesn't mean that I'm laughing at anybody or because I, I do. I make jokes today. And it doesn't mean I'm laughing at anybody who's been abused. It doesn't mean I'm laughing at the tragedy of sexual abuse. It means I have a sense of humor trying to keep a perspective to thrive in the profession that I am in with the population that I'm working with. Because I don't have a sense of humor. I don't have any perspective dead in the water. I couldn't be doing this. Could not be doing this. Now, 30%, when I looked at statistics, about 30% of healthcare professionals across the board in the United States have been touched by childhood sexual abuse in their personal lives. About 30%. 
when you look at mental health practitioners, okay, that figure jumps to 60% have been touched by childhood sexual abuse in their personal lives. Okay. So there is something you've probably heard about. It's called the delayed memory controversy. Some people call it the false memory controversy. Has anybody heard of that? OK. And one of the things that's come out of this controversy is that mental health practitioners, the, the false memory people, if I want to call it that, or people on that side of the debate, a controversy, talk about how mental health practitioners have not done their own personal work around their sexual abuse issues, thereby they are trying to work out their own stuff through their clients, thereby suggesting, leading, and planting false accusations of abuse in their clients' minds. It's been one of the major criticisms in the last almost 10 years now since the inception of the False Memory Syndrome Foundation. Is there bad therapy happening out there? Mm-hmm. Yes, there is. Are there mental health practitioners who are not doing their own personal work? Yes. Is it possible to lead or suggest somebody around, a, around an incident of childhood sexual abuse? It is possible to lead or suggest, the research is telling us, and I'm going to go more into this a little in about 10 minutes, the research is telling us it's possible to lead or suggest around details of a traumatic memory. Okay, and that'll make more sense to you in a few minutes. We have no empirical research to date that validates implantation of horrendous memory of childhood sexual abuse in somebody's mind. There is no empirical research that says that we can implant a horrendous memory of childhood sexual abuse in somebody's mind. That's a really important piece of information. And again, we're going to talk a little bit about, more about that. But today, a lot of today's information when we talk about practice and how to do some of this stuff is flavored by what we've learned around this false memory controversy and the research that's come out because of it, and how we've questioned some of the techniques and philosophies around working with childhood trauma. So that's one of the gifts, I think, that's come out of the controversy, is that we do have more research and we, more, we are more conscientious about some of the things that we do now. Now, I want, would like you to just know that the, the handout is about 70 pages, which means we are not going to go over, over everything in the handout. We're going to cover about 40 some odd pages, which is a really nice chunk. And then in the back, you have resources, and you have bibliography, and you have as m much as I could give you. And I'm going to be highlighting some of the resources for you today. And there are going to be some things that are not in the resource directory that I've, because I'm updating the handout, that I'll offer to you if you want to jot them down, some more materials, literature, whatever. All right. Two last things before we go into the, into the handout. One is that I have a philosophy for my presentation today. And that is, please take what you like and leave the rest. Totally OK for you to disagree with how I work with clients. And a, a bulk of what we're going to be talking today is my perception and my view about this and how I work with clients. Some of what we're going to be talking today is research and some basic facts. So I just ask you to keep an open mind to the best of your ability. But you definitely do not have to agree. <laughs> February of 1994, one of my first seminars, another part of the country, lawyer shows up and he says, I want to know what you have to say about the following. He says, I'm re representing mentally retarded woman who was 25 years old, raped by the security officer in her apartment complex. Criminal charges pressed convicted, he's doing about 15, 18 months for this, okay? which you can have your own your feelings about just that. But now we're looking at civil suit for compensation and damages. The defense for the offender going to use the following arguments so that she does not get compensation. Here we go. One, she's mentally retarded. She couldn't have processed the rape like normal women. She wasn't affected in the same way. Two, she has a history of childhood sexual abuse. It's not like this was the first time it happened, which would have been extremely traumatic. Yeah, well, I'm glad to see the reactions. Very glad to see the reactions. Now, that's 1994. It's seven years later. Is the same kind of thinking still happening? Yes. 
Very, very much so. And you'd really be surprised with the court, some of the court cases about some of the reasoning and things. And if, if you've been in the front lines, you know, and I don't have to tell you. It's very scary. It's very scary. Please, if you, whatever you like from today, and even whatever you don't like, if you want to pass that on to people in your community, because you have the networking, please do that. You can um, copy what's in, this, what's in this handout. Okay, please get the information out there. Okay, now, page one. Lecture information. This is where we do our definitions. And the first piece we're going to do is called psychic trauma. And we are going to look at trauma in general first, and then begin to look at sexual trauma. So trauma in general, what is psychic trauma? The experience of helpless, vulnerable, unsafe, and out of control that occurs from an overwhelming, uncontrollable event or series of events. So with what you know already, at 9.30, would you agree that for a prepubescent child, sexual abuse, overwhelming, uncontrollable event or series of events? Make sense? Yes. Does it make sense the kid would feel unsafe, out of control? OK, yes. How about the, the age 15, if the abuse begins at 15, would the same still fit? How about an adult rape victim? Yes. So there are a few points I want to make here. One is that across the board for kids, adolescents, and adults, we see very similar signs and symptoms. We see very similar signs and symptoms for kids, adolescents, and adults. They may be displayed differently because of developmental differences, but they're very similar signs and symptoms. Okay. Now, Research has attempted to identify a behavioral symptom, or what we call psychiatric symptom, or a cluster of behavioral or psychiatric symptoms, so that we can see it, or we can hear the client tell us about it, and we can say, aha, you have A, or you have A, B, C, and D. It's been around six months. It's done this. It's done that. Therefore, absolutely, you've been sexually abused. Has research shown us the, the behavioral symptom or the cluster of behavioral symptoms yet? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. What has research shown us? It has shown us the five or six most common signs or symptoms for substantiated physical sexual abuse slash incest cases, substantiated through CPS okay, in the United States the five or six most common signs or symptoms. Okay. And they're in your handout there. Depression, including suicidal and homicidal thoughts and, and attempts. Anxiety and anxiety disorders, things like generalized anxiety disorder. I include post-traumatic stress disorder here. Right now in the DSM-4, it is under PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, is categorized under anxiety disorders. That may be different when the DSM-5 comes out, by the way. Okay, there's a lot of talk about they're, they're creating a whole new category for the five called extreme stress disorders. And post-traumatic stress disorder would be under there. Okay, and they may even put dissociative disorders under there rather than in their own category. So we just have to see what happens when it comes out. We have plenty of room toward the front if you'd like to come and join us. We'd love for you to. I don't bite. I really, I don't. And I usually call on people in the back when I like, have my lapse of memory. I say, oh, could you remind me? Great. So anxiety disorders, generalized, post-traumatic stress disorder. I also talk about obsessive compulsive disorders under here. They're anxiety disorders. Dissociation, number three. What is dissociation? It's the splitting off of or compartmentalizing of. The splitting off of or compartmentalizing of. Thoughts, feelings, to the extent possibly of parts of myself. So it seems like I have different personalities in one body here. 
but the reality is they're not different personalities in one body. They are very distinct parts of one personality in one body. And that is possibly what we call dissociative identity disorder. Used to be called multiple personality disorder. It's not called that anymore because we know it's not about different personalities in one body. It's about distinct parts of one personality in one body. Created, brilliantly adapted from severe catastrophic trauma that usually began pre-verbally and went on for a long period of time. So there is a continuum of dissociation, and we're going to talk about that this afternoon. Now, some of you may say, well, I've never seen anybody have parts or whatever, so I've never seen anybody dissociate. I would take a guess you have and you didn't even know it. For example, you're interviewing somebody, and I'm talking kids, adolescents, or adults, and they're telling you about what happened to them, about their trauma, okay? And they're telling it to you like they're telling you what they had for lunch, or they're smiling as they're telling you. Has anybody experienced that? Yes. Guess what? You've seen dissociation. They have split off the emotional, the emotions from the verbal intellectual content in order to what? Anybody? Survive. In order to survive. Dissociation is a powerful survival skill. Powerful survival skill. Okay. Does it start to cause more problems than it solves? Yes. That's where we come in, OK? So it is a powerful survival skill. And it starts to cause more problems than it solves. All right. We'll talk more, a lot more about dissociation today. Compulsive masturbation, sometimes to the point of injury. Sometimes to the point of injury. Substance abuse. When I read this, I was so psyched because I said, we've been seeing this for so long in the treatment centers and outpatient work, but we've had no empirical evidence, and now we do, that there is a very strong correlation between childhood sexual abuse and substance abuse. So yay. Now, you're a substance abuse counselor. And what you've been trained to do is you don't work on any emotional issues until the person's one year sober. All you do is you make them go to 12-step meetings and not drink or not drug for that first year. Okay. Well, that's very nice, but how many of you work with just drug addicts or alcoholics, and they have no other diagnosis and no other issues. How many people? OK. It's insane. It's crazy. OK. How many people work with anybody who has one diagnosis? I mean, it's just, it's not realistic. OK. So what we know now is we have to do a lot of work at the same time. We have to help, we have to assist people in getting sober or getting abstinent from addictions and working on some of the emotional issues at the same time because you don't, it's a relapse issue, right? You got somebody in detox, you got somebody in the first three months of sobriety or abstinence. You got feelings coming up, don't you? You possibly have nightmares and you possibly have flashbacks starting. What do you tell somebody? Sorry, we can't do that until you're, you're sober. So you're working on stabilizing some of those post-traumatic stress symptoms, like flashbacks, okay? startle response, insomnia, okay? you st and, and depressive symptoms also. So a lot of times it's difficult to tell what the diagnoses are because you've got a lot of stuff going on at the same time. So you're doing a lot of the same work. We do a lot of stabilizing. And the recommendation is you don't go digging for more. And that's across the board around trauma now. You don't go digging for more. You work with what is presented. So when somebody's getting clean, it's not about, let's go do hypnosis and regression to go find more memories for you. It's about what's showing up right now, how can we help you to stabilize that without using, okay? and how can we continue to encourage you to use what we call thriving skills instead of your old survival skills like your drinking or drugging. And then you have self-mutilating behavior. And we usually think about self-mutilating behavior as things like cutting, carving with knives, scissors, razor blades. Could be trying to cut off or cut out genitals. It could be marks all over the arms and the legs, uh, the stomach area. There was a l professional who was talking about her client who <clears throat> excuse me, inserted carpet needles in her abdomen 
and how to have them surgically removed. And that was this client's way of self-mutilating. Okay. Is everybody who self-mutilates, have they been sexually abused? What's the answer to that? No. Okay. Is there a strong correlation? Yes. Other forms of self-mutilating, we think about burning with cigarettes, pipes, matches, head banging, pulling out hair and eyelashes. Okay. There are a lot of things we can think of as self-mutilating behavior. I'm going to ask you to stretch a little bit, going from kind of the micro view to the more macro view. What about the possibility of, the possibility of tattoos and body piercing? Possibility of. Okay. I'm not saying anybody who has a tattoo is sexually abused. Okay. Possibility of obsession compulsion with liposuction, stom stomach staplings, facelifts, nose jobs, all kinds of plastic surgeries and medical procedures. Possibility of. Okay. So just encourage you to kind of think outside the box a little bit about what could possibly be self-mutilating for this particular client. Okay. So now you have six of the most common signs and symptoms for substantiated reported child sexual abuse cases. You see somebody who has one or a combination of those and you say, aha, they have been sexually abused and I am going to gear all my interventions and all my questions so that I get the disclosure that I know is true. What are you doing? You are practicing unethically and you are setting yourself up for a big time lawsuit. So is it okay for us to go on our own agenda? No. Do we have to have hypotheses though and say there's a, there's a good possibility this person's showing a lot of the signs and symptoms? We have to have that. Mandated report says evidence of or suspicion of, correct? Do we have enough suspicion in order to report? The, re the recommendation is you always check out with colleagues or supervisors before you go by yourself and go and report. You may want to call CPS with an anonymous phone call. Hypothetically, <laughs> if I had a client that, would I have enough to report? Okay. So this is, these six are not the criteria. Anybody has one or a combination of these, immediately they've been sexually abused. No. Most common for, for childhood sexual abuse. Right. <clears throat> now, related to this, along with this delayed, in this delayed memory controversy, one of the things that's happened to mental health professionals when they go into the court is they have a disclosure, either from a kid or an adolescent, or it really started with the adults who were recovering memories. Okay? And there was not enough outside corroborating evidence when they went to the court to sue on um, their alleged abuser. And the therapist gets on the stand and says, you know, my client told me and I believe my client. And then the cross-examination says, well, what other corroborating evidence do you have? And there wasn't enough to substantiate the case and the therapist gets discredited and it's just a mess. Okay. So the recommendation of what we say when somebody discloses is the following, and it's on your handout, in your handout there. It says, I believe you're telling me your truth and or as much of your truth as you can or you're willing to right now. Number one, it's about their perception of what happened. Now, that can be very invalidating to some people, and they say, well, it's not my truth, it's the truth. You don't believe me just like everybody else doesn't believe me. So I say things like, I believe your pain. I believe the marks all over your body. I believe your suicide attempts. I believe your truancy in school. I believe your frozen body language. I mean, whatever it may be. But I wasn't there and I don't have a video camera <laughs> to be able to say that every single thing you're telling me is absolutely factually accurate. Okay? Now, I wouldn't say that last statement to a client. I'm telling you that. Okay? It's one of the things we know about remembering is that it is remembering from other experiences. And <clears throat> so we got to be really careful about that. So I believe you're telling me your truth and or as much of your truth as you can or you're willing to. So it might be that they're testing the waters and they're giving us certain pieces but not everything that they have. 
and they're not ready to give us everything they have yet. So as much as you're willing to right now, okay? The can piece, documented research, nobody can argue with this, there is something called dissociative amnesia. Dissociative amnesia. How many people have heard of the term repressed memory? Most of you here, okay. So guess what? Stop using the term, okay? Throw it out. How come? Because there has been so much controversy about the term repression, the Freudian term putting something from the conscious to the unconscious. What research says is about 30% of kids who have been sexually abused, and again, it's based on substantiated reported cases of physical sexual abuse and incest. About 30% of these kids will experience dissociative amnesia sometime in their life. So what is dissociative amnesia? Dissociative amnesia is the amnesia, the blocking out of the full event or events of their abuse or parts of the event or events of their abuse. And those can be blocked out, they can be amnestic to those for hours, days, months, or years. It is possible for someone to have absolutely no recollection of being sexually abused and at 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, 60, 70, 80, to start having recovering memories. It absolutely is possible. The people on, from the False Memory Syndrome Foundation say, uh-uh, okay? And I'll give you a hint that one of the things one of the difficulties with the false memory literature is that they are talking about memory research that is not traumatic memory. Elizabeth Loftus, you may have heard of Elizabeth Loftus. She's a professor of psychology out of the University of Washington. She is probably the major spokesperson in terms of memory research. Uh, she's on the scientific advisory board of the False Memory Syndrome Foundation. She's been in a lot of media, and she does research on non-traumatic memory. Highly emotional but non-traumatic memory. And her research is saying you can suggest, you can lead, you can implant. The peop what, what they're trying to do is take her research and put it in the traumatic memory field. And the people who do research on traumatic memory say stored process, different parts of the brain, different ways, cannot generalize one to the other. So we're going to talk today about the biology of trauma and what we so far know about how the brain stores and processes traumatic material. And I'll let you know right now, we know about that much. We don't know so much more than we know. You're getting just the little pieces that are starting to come out right now. Okay. So dissociative amnesia, absolutely there. Instead of using repressed memory, it's called dissociative amnesia. The just, the just of a traumatic memory stays intact and accurate over time, whether there is amnesia or not. The just stays intact and accurate. The details of that traumatic memory, excuse me, may be in error because of commission or omission. I might put stuff in that doesn't belong. I might leave stuff out that was important. I may mess up sequence of events. I may mess up how, how young I was. I can even misidentify the perpetrator. So those are the things that we can lead or suggest around depending on our relationship with the client, how suggestible they are, and how isolated they are. Okay? There are many, many different factors in terms of suggesting and leading. Okay? If you are the kind of mental health professional who takes on the role of God, tells people what they need to do, you know everything, okay? then you are setting up a very big abuse of power with your client. And if the client is somebody who's very isolated, doesn't have much of a support system, and allows you and sees you as this godlike figure, and they score high on suggestibility tests, you got really, you know, that's a recipe for disaster there. So one of the recommendations around childhood sexual abuse treatment is support system, support system, and support system. And continuing to get 
to get an open system rather than a closed system. All right. So you got dissociative amnesia. The just stays accurate. Details can be inaccurate. That's what we can lead or suggest around. So we have to stay away from jumping to conclusions. We got to use the signs and symptoms we're talking about today as red flags. Something's going on, possibly sexual abuse. Could these six signs or symptoms be also signs and symptoms for other forms of child abuse? Yes, absolutely. And you're going to see that throughout today when we talk about different signs and symptoms. You're going to say, well, that could be for emotional abuse. Well, that could be for physical abuse. That's right. Absolutely correct. That's why we are in the gray, anxious area when we work with this population. Okay. How many of you have had a case where you have reported and CPS could not find enough to move on? And how many of the CPS workers have experienced that? Okay. How many of you have worked with those cases and you in your gut know that this kid's being abused? Okay. So, have you ever felt helpless, vulnerable, unsafe, and out of control in your work? <laughs> have you ever seen your job as just a series of uncontrollable, overwhelming events? I would take a guess. At some point, yes. Okay. Can we be traumatized by this work with this population? Yes. Absolutely. There's a whole body of literature now about what's called vicarious traumatization. How are we, the professionals dealing with people who've been sexually abused, how are we affected? Teachers, social workers, clergy, law enforcement, doesn't matter, across the board. At every conference on violence and, and trauma, you see a, either a, a, a keynote, you see a workshop on what's called vicarious traumatization. Helping the helper, caring for the caregiver, something like that, because it's major. And so that's another piece that we'll share about and talk about this afternoon. Okay. So pay attention to the victim's perception, very important. Stay away from jumping to conclusions. And you know, because you're mandated reporters, that the disclosure alone is not enough that other outside corroborating evidence has to be, <clears throat> and a lot of times we don't get it. Okay. So my job today is to acknowledge the reality. We work in a lot of the gray area. It's very frustrating. It's scary. How do we stay afloat as professionals with the reality of the systems that we have in place and the reality that we don't have any black and white? You have been, you haven't been sexually abused. We move to the next page. We're looking at child abuse in general. The process where kids are used to meet caregivers' needs, caregivers not there available to meet child's needs. Okay? Again, I'm asking you to stretch a little bit here. Remember, keep an open mind to the best of your ability. Don't have to agree with this. Don't have to buy this. So it's Sunday night. It's 9 o'clock. I have a business trip the next day. I have a 7, 7 a.m. flight, which means I have to get up at 5. I've had my son's 7-year-old son all weekend. Okay? He runs 24 hours a day and like falls into bed and falls asleep. So I am exhausted. It's an hour past his bedtime. I'm reading to him, and he says, just five more minutes, Mommy. Let me stay up five more minutes. And he's doing his thing to manipulate to stay up later. Because he's seven, he's supposed to do that, right? It's developmentally appropriate. OK. <laughs> so I say to him, I say, Ian, I need you to go to sleep. Is that what I'm talking about here? He's meeting my needs. No. OK. What I call what I just did, I call it child abuse prevention. <laughs> Good, you left at the right time. OK. Child abuse prevention. So what I'm talking about here is, for example, little three-year-old girl that we work with. She's got a one-year-old brother she calls her baby. How come? She's responsible for him. She takes care of him. Now, how does something like this happen? Well, mom and dad are crack cocaine alcoholics. Okay. Now, mom and dad are in treatment. And they say to us, would you leave our kids alone? They don't need any extra help. Okay? We're here in treatment. We're getting clean and sober. That's enough. Well, our kids are fine. Okay. Does anybody know what fine 
means? The nice version for the video, the nice version. Frustrated, insecure, neurotic, and emotional or empty. Frustrated, insecure, neurotic, and emotional or empty. Okay. Now, these parents didn't know what fine meant. So we, the staff, said, help enlighten us about how your kids are fine and don't need any extra help. Well, we're wealthy. We have money. These kids have everything they ever wanted and needed. These kids were too young. They no way they could even know we were high. And you know, they never saw a smoke crack. I mean, we drank in front of them. Everybody drinks. That's not a big deal. But they never saw a smoke crack. And they never saw us like, bl you know, blanked out, passed out on the floor. They didn't have to clean up our vomit. They didn't have to do anything that kids of addicts have to do. So they weren't affected by it. We had a correlation between substance abuse and child sexual abuse a few minutes ago. I want to jump to another one. I want to jump to the correlation between addiction in general and childhood sexual abuse because more and more information is coming out about addiction in general. Okay. So we're going to take a time travel back in time, folks, back in time to Psychology 101, if you can remember that far back. Psychology 101. Okay. Class, what coping mechanism or mechanisms do you hear in statements from the parents? Say it out. Denial. What else? Rationalization. What else? Displacement. Do you hear minimization? Do you hear justifying? Does anybody hear delusion? What world are you living in, you know? Wake up, hello. OK, so two main coping skills for addiction are denial and delusion. DD, two biggies, denial and delusion, with justifying, rationalizing, and minimizing coming in a very close second. Okay. Denial and delusion. Our kids weren't affected. What are, you what are you talking about? I only drank natural wine. I mean, I don't know what you're talking about. No, you see, you don't get it. Marijuana is God's way of saying hi. You see, if God didn't want us to smoke it, right, he have, wouldn't have us grow it. Denial, delusion, justifying, rationalizing, minimizing. Okay. Now, correlation between addiction and childhood sexual abuse. So what do you think the two main coping skills for childhood sexual abuse are? Got to get it, guys. Denial and delusion with justifying, rationalizing, and minimizing coming in a very close second. And that is true. No, I wasn't abused. No, I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. No, I don't know what you're talking about. This was a special relationship that I had with so-and-so. They told me I was a, their special little boy or little girl. It felt good. It was loving. Nobody beat me. I don't have black and blues. Nobody put a knife to my throat. I, no bleeding, cutting, tearing, bruising, none of that. I mean, it felt good. I got aroused. I liked it. I kept going back for more. I didn't want to tell anybody. Okay. How could that be abuse? No, it's only abuse if you're forced. I wasn't forced. Okay. Well, it doesn't happen in the big cities, like you know the Twin Cities. No, it happens in those states where they don't really even have too many people, you know, like the Arizona, New Mexico kind of places. <laughs> What happens in Appalachia, coming from New York, I always heard, yeah, it's like upstate or it's you know, kind of around the mountains. and It's not in the cities. And then here I am growing up in a middle class Jewish family on Long Island. And what I'm told is, number one, let's get it straight right now, no Jewish alcoholics. Okay? There are no Jewish alcoholics because, number one, we're much better than that. Okay. Number two, we use alcohol in ritual, you see, and that protects us from becoming addicts. Okay. It's the Irish Catholics and the Germans you got to look out for. <laughs> That's what I was told. So who were the only guys I dated? Irish Catholics. Okay. <laughs> then, absolutely no incest happens in Jewish families. How come? Because the family is the crux of Jewish life. No way would we ever hurt our kids or spouse or whatever. Okay. And there's just in the last five, five years, there's just a beginning of acknowledgement of substance abuse and addiction in the Jewish community. And there's just beginning to be conferences about violence, domestic violence, in the Jewish community. OK? 
Okay. So I'm not here to bash Jews by any you know, stretch of the sense. I just wanted to give you the example of that denial, delusion, justifying, and rationalizing. So here I am growing up in this family, and of course I'm thinking I'm absolutely crazy and there's no way that this is happening and I'm denying for myself what's going on because it can't be happening. It's pretty crazy making. Okay. And at 14 and a half years sober, my mother will still tell you she's not an alcoholic. She graduated with honors. She didn't this, blah, 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 blah. No. So there's still a tremendous amount of denial. So incest. Here we go to specific sexual trauma. However, I'm asking you to stretch your definition of incest. Because usually we think about incest as physical sexual contact between blood relatives and or step family. And this definition saying doesn't have to be blood relatives or step family. It can be anybody who has a power differential with that child, who has more power, who the child perceives has more power than them. And there's, a, there's an element of trust in that relationship already there that gets sexually violated. And it can be sexually violated emotionally and or physically. And we're going to talk about the difference between emotional and physical incest in a few minutes. Right now, we're just going to do in general. So the violation of the power differential and trust, the sexual violation of those two, make it incest in the model I'm presenting to you today. And again, remember, you don't have to buy this. doesn't have to fit. Just kind of let it be. Let it be. So it could be clergy person, youth group leader, therapist, doctor, nurse, um, one of the, you know, quote, unquote, big brother, big sister, um, boy scout leader, girl scout leader, babysitter. Okay. The majority of reported cases of childhood sexual abuse to CPS in this country, okay, the majority of reported cases are perpetrated by somebody the kid knows, loves, and trusts. We're talking 80 plus percent. Okay? So in this model, we would consider the majority of cases being incest cases. Incest is about a relationship. It's already, the relationship's already formed. So it's more likely to be an ongoing thing than a one-time event. Okay. It's more likely to be ongoing. Jan Heinman, H-I-N-D-M-A-N in her research found that young children who've been abused will most likely first disclose to somebody they perceive as a major caregiver. Stereotypically, okay, let's say mom is the first person they disclose to, again, stereotyping. And they get the, they get the response of, shut up, you must, be, you must have wanted it. What did you do to ask for it? I mean, I know what's happening, we're not gonna talk about it. If you just forget about it, it'll go away. Okay. What's going to happen to that kid? That kid is going to take that, and it's going to, that secret is going to go deeper. And that kid is much less likely to disclose again. And there's more shame involved. Okay. And secrets are really big here. We talk about that throughout the day also. They're extremely powerful. And incest happens in secret which means shame, fear, exploitation, and danger all wrapped around with that. Very different than private, just none of your business. Secrets are very different. So if a kid gets that kind of response, shut up, forget about it, I know you wanted it, what'd you do to ask for it? They show up much less resilient later on than the child who discloses, who gets, oh my goodness, an action is taken to protect them, even when even when that action might not work so well. When they are believed and action is taken to protect them, they show up more resilient than when they get blamed and shamed. And a lot of times what will happen is somebody or a couple, few people or a group of people will believe them, action is taken, and the bigger system doesn't follow through. And so they feel very betrayed by that system, very victimized by the system. And for the therapist, that's a very important piece to work on about, again, that betrayal and that re-victimization and re-traumatization. The other thing that Jan Heinemann said is that, akin to this, the longer the secret is kept, the more damage psychologically is done to the individual. So let's say 
you have somebody who's incested from six to nine years old physically. That physical part stops. Now they're 35 in your office. They've never told anybody about this. Okay? They are going to be talking to you, and they are going to have internally been exposed to that incest from 6 to 35 years of age. That's how powerful that secret is. Okay? So they're going to show more damaging kind of psychological symptoms than somebody who was able to talk more about it, get some counseling about it, and do some work on it. So the breaking the secret of this is critical to the healing process, but it's not all that has to happen. There's a myth out there that as long as you tell one person, see, I told people it's not a secret. I can just read my self-help books and I'm OK. And I'm, I'm fine. That's what I like to say. Right, yeah, fine. Okay. You'll never see fine the same way again after you leave today. <laughs> all right. So related to this, there are four equations or associations that I see that get set up unconsciously as a result of the incest and the dynamic around the incest. Okay. One, power equals violation. They're all in your hand out there. Power equals violation. Sex equals power. Sex equals love. And anger equals rage. And the longer the secret is kept, the more ingrained these associations become. The longer the incest goes on, the more ingrained these associations become. And you've got to remember that they're unconscious. Okay. So the first one we're going to look at is power equals violation. Power equals violation. Now, there are two extremely powerful forms of learning that we have. Okay. The two most powerful forms of learning are, does anybody know? One is experience, and two is modeling. Okay? Experience and modeling, two most powerful forms of learning. You get the least powerful form of learning today, which is lecture. You already know, because I see some people's eyes closed, and you're ready for a break. The least powerful form of learning. Any parents in the audience? You know lecture is the least powerful form of learning. If you haven't learned it by now, know it. Okay. So the most powerful form of learning, experience and modeling. What happens to this kid? This kid gets put in the victim role. Do they have a choice about it? No. They are put in the victim role. They experience the victim role with every cell of their body overwhelmingly, traumatically. What is the victim experience? It is helpless, vulnerable, unsafe, and out of control. That is the victim experience. Helpless, vulnerable, unsafe, and out of control. They're experiencing that with every cell of their body overwhelming. What are they getting modeled? They're getting modeled the perpetrator role. Somebody who has power has power over them versus assisting them and supporting them in empowerment. Because that's our role with kids is as adults, is to assist them in empowering themselves. But this doesn't happen. What happens is power over. I'm the one with the power. I'm going to have power over you, which means I'm going to violate you and not respect your boundaries. Okay. So they learn very fast about that victim role. Okay. Overwhelming locks it in. Okay. So there are two things about this. One is. What kind of behavior do we see because of this power equals violation? Because okay? this kid gets it. If somebody's got the power, they violate. That's how people have power. One thing we're going to see is violating behavior to self and others. And it may be sexually violating, and it may not be sexually violating. We can see bullying. We can see delinquency and criminal behavior. We can see shaming and blaming. Okay? Does not have to be sexual perpetration. I don't want you leaving today thinking that any kid who's been sexually abused is going to go out and sexually perpetrate somebody else. That is a myth. Statistics say about 27% of kids who've been sexually abused will sexually perpetrate somebody else in their lifetime, about 27%. So that means about 73% never sexually perpetrate somebody. All right. So we go back. We say, OK, so they get. They're in this victim role. They feel it. They get modeled the perpetrator role. What happens to them is they get role locked in the victim role. That's a psychodrama term. What does it mean? It means that they put the victim glasses on. They see the world through the victim lenses. And the only way they can do relationship with anybody until they know different, because remember, this is unconscious, until they know different, 
is they are going to be in the victim role. They are going to flip over to the perp role. They're going to flip to the rescuer role, or they're going to be in the passive bystander role. That's the rectangle that's on your sheet there. It's the only way that they, only roles that they know how to be in, in relationship, because of their initial learning about power equals violation. Victim role, perp role. Okay. So you got somebody, and remember this is unconscious, you got somebody who may live their life out as a victim. That's like their identity. Why me, why me, poor me, poor me, can you do this for me? Okay, I can't do it for myself. Alcoholics Anonymous says, pour me, pour me, pour me a drink. Okay? So the victim role for a recovering drunk is not a good place to be. It's like, get out of that role as fast as you can. Okay? So you know, because I'm sure you've seen people, you've talked to them over the phone, they're walking down the hallway, and you know they're a victim right off the bat. Okay? The really critical thing is, what's your counter-transference to the victim role? What are your specific physical, emotional reactions to somebody who's in the victim role? Okay? That's the stuff you take to supervision. So here's one of my students in the Masters of Counseling program came into faculty supervision. She said, I have a great way to use my counter-transference. I said, talk about it. She said, I pretty much know now when somebody's in the victim role. How? Well, there's this part of me that just gets really stirred up, and I start getting these like thoughts and fantasies of saying, snap out of it! <laughs> Remember Cher and Moonstruck? Snap out of it. So we talked about, she said, I just want to slap them. So what happens? Her perpetrator part gets triggered. Okay? As nice as we all are and we want to help people, guess what? You all have a perp part, you all have a victim part, you all have a rescuer part, and you all have a passive bystander part. How much they define who we are is a whole different story. But we all have these parts in us, and the quote unquote victim has these parts in them too, which is a big piece of treatment for them to get they even have a perp part. Oh my God. Okay. So, what we did was in the next six months, we talked about slap therapy. Okay. Now, you can talk about slap therapy in confidential supervision. You don't go out telling people that you have fantasies about slapping your clients, correct? Okay. But I would take a guess that at least 50% of you who at, at one time or another have had some kind of fantasy like that about a client. Okay. So that's normal, natural, and human. What do you do about it? Okay. That's what, we want, that's what I want to talk about. And I also want to respect our break time. We've got about five minutes to break time. Okay. So let me close this piece up. All right. So you got the person who's the victim. Then you got, on some level, somebody makes the decision no way am I going to be helpless like that. I'm going to be the one with the power. And you got them flipping into perp role. Every role comes back to victim. Because if you ever worked with somebody who perps, and that's sexually or non-sexually, aren't they always the victim of things? Well, the cop was out to get me. Well, you know, she wanted it. It wasn't about me. Okay? It all goes back to victim. So they do that perp role, and they do bullying, or they do picking on other kids, or whatever. Then you got some people who say, no way am I ever going to be that helpless. No way am I going to hurt anybody. I'm going to fix, save, and rescue everybody so they don't have to go through what I went through. All right, you got the rescuer. You got the person who's such a good listener all the time. Okay. Anybody relate to that? Yeah. Okay. Why would we be in the profession we're in, folks? Okay. So next role, passive bystander. Freeze. That's what the passive bystander does. Freezes and is not able to take any action, okay? and, which is different than victim. Right? And so the passive bystander has drama and chaos around them a lot in their life. And that's a big pattern for them. And they always kind of find themselves in the midst of all this drama and chaos. It's not directly happening to them necessarily. But they always find themselves in the midst, and they can't do anything about it, and they freeze. There are five things we do when, we, when our life, our survival is threatened. And it's hooked up in our biological central nervous system. Okay? Five things we do. And we have a choice of one or a combination of these. We fight. We flee. We freeze. We play dead. Or we dissociate. Fight, flee, freeze, play dead, or dissociate. And everybody's got their favorite, and everybody has the combination of favorites for them and what, what kind of works for them. And the person is the passive bystander. That's kind of what they do. Okay. Now, 
Has anybody found themselves in the rescuer role in their job at any time? OK. I want to give you a little bit of a scenario about rescuer role and give you some recommendations about it. When I moved to Tucson in 1990, I'm in a clinical supervision group, and my mentor asks me, Adina, what led you to be a social worker in the first place? I say, because I want to help people. Right out there, OK? He said, um, all right, I'd like you to take a breath. And I'm going to ask you again, Adina, what led you to become a social worker in the first place? Because I want to help people. He looks me straight in the face and he says, bullshit. I'm very insulted. <laughs> I'm thinking, got me through graduate school. I mean, everybody else said the same thing. I mean, I've always wanted to help people. Since I was 14, I knew I was going to be a, some kind of clinician. I was always the listener, always helped everybody else with their problems. I, I don't understand. He said, I want you to really kind of take stock and, and just continue in supervision, continue in your own personal work, and see what happens. OK. So two and a half years later, after continuing supervision, being five weeks inpatient treatment at the Meadows Treatment Program in Arizona for codependency, and doing my own personal work, I show up to supervision. I say, OK, Ed, I have a different answer. He said, what's the answer? I said, I had this fantasy, you see, that I, if I could fix other people and their families, see, because I got the letters after my name, got all the specialized training. So now if I could fix them, then the pain and inadequacy that I was carrying around from not being able to fix my own family, that would go away. So he looked at me and he said, good answer. Okay. So what happened was I started to see professionally and personally how being in this rescuer role was not real helpful for me and or for the client. Number one. Every time I went into a session, I had a mindset like this. I said, well, I'm really good at assessment. I'll figure out what's wrong with you. I'll write the perfect treatment plan. You'll follow that treatment plan perfectly, and then you will be fine. Did anybody follow the treatment plan? No. How come? Because I didn't even invite them to write it with me. You're supposed to do that. So I walk in playing God. My friends say to me, you have a CISW, not a GOD. Okay. I think I know what's best for everybody else. So I'm going to do all this, and then they're going to get better. Okay. Well, they started missing appointments, not doing homework assignments. They weren't progressing as fast as they were supposed to. I mean, I could go on and on. So what happens? So I start getting pissed off. Don't you know how hard I'm working for you? Okay. Anybody know this? Okay. That's called the Al-Anon salute, if anybody didn't know that. Okay. Rescuer and martyr role are very close together, OK? And victim doesn't follow far after that. And so I'm working so hard. I'm working harder than they are. Their recovery is more important to me than it is to them. Anybody relate to that? And I'm pissed. Now, you're not supposed to be angry at your clients. So I'm trying to deal with it in supervision. However, I'm sarcastic. So the sarcasm starts seeping out sideways. My perpetrator part got triggered, and it's starting to show up. I feel victimized by them. How come I'm the person who gets all these clients? My, my colleagues seem to get everybody who does just fine. You know What's going on? I find myself in the, in the passive bystander role more often. What happened? Personally, pain, deeper, bigger, ended up in inpatient treatment. Best thing ever happened to me. Professionally, what happened? When I'm in the rescuer role, I unconsciously enter that rectangle. And once I'm un unconsciously in there, the only way I can relate to my clients is the, are the roles in that rectangle. And what, I'm, what I am doing in that is I am reenacting emotionally what happened to them in their trauma and their family of origin system. I am not providing a corrective emotional experience the way I'm supposed to. And Experience and modeling are the two most powerful forms of learning. And so if all I'm doing is reenacting their trauma, are they learning anything different? No. I am I'm just consistently deepening that for myself and them. And actually, Medical Educational Services sponsors a one-day seminar on reactive attachment disorder. By, and Kenny Miller is the gentleman who presents that. And if you have not seen that, I really want to highlight Kenny, his presentation, and the information that he shares with you uh, about that diagnosis and the treatment for kids who have that severe abuse and neglect uh, in early childhood. 
What percentage of people that molest have been molested? Well, what we're saying is about 27% of kids who have been sexually abused will sexually perpetrate somebody else in their lifetime. Please say more about what you would specifically say to a client who asks if you believe what, that they were abused after you validate their pain, scars, etc. When they try to pin you down as to whether you do or do not believe the abuse occurred, what is the percentage of perpetrators who were sexually abused themselves? Please say concrete ways or responses that indicate you may be reenacting the pattern of abuse with your clients. Okay. So what I would specifically say to a client who's trying to pin me down is I would say, you know what? I was not there. And one of the things that we know is that when we remember, the gist of that is accurate. The gist of that is correct. But there are some other things that may be not so accurate, like kind of the way things happened or the sequence they happened in. And that's why I, I cannot say I absolutely believe you. And I also want to make sure, because you said this, I want to make sure we have the best chance of getting you the help that you need around this. And if I start saying to you, I believe you blanket, okay? I believe you that when more adults get involved, that might hurt you and you telling me about this rather than help you. Okay. That's the best I'm going to be able to do. When I have an adult, okay, I can start talking about, an adolescent or adult, I can start talking about the research on memory and what we know about traumatic memory is. When I have a little kid, I can't talk that way. So I have to say things like, I am one of the adults who's going to try to help you. And I believe. I absolutely believe that something happened to you to cause you this much pain, OK? And I can't say exactly what it was, whatever. And so I want to get you to the people who can, can help you and who can, we can absolutely say that this happened. For example, that, that would be a lead into it's real important that the next step we do is get you to a doctor for an exam, OK? Now, how often do you get conclusive medical evidence? <laughs> Not very often. Does that mean, OK, it didn't happen to them? No. It means that, and I would tell them that, there's a lot of times when we don't get that kind of stuff when you get a medical exam. And it's still very important for us to get that. So I just want to be honest and direct and yet not promise anything that I cannot deliver. That's another very important piece. Several teachers have come to the seminar promising kids that they'd get them out of their homes. They weren't able to do that, or they got them out for a little bit, and then they were ordered back in their homes. And what do these kids experience? They experience re-traumatization and betrayal. So I got to be really careful about that. And specifically, or concretely, responses that indicate you may be reenacting pattern of abuse with your clients. Well, if you're starting to get angry because you're working harder than they are, and they're not taking their, their treatment very seriously, if you feel like If you find yourself sideways doing the anger, if you find yourself really fantasizing a lot about how you don't want to work with this person and they would miss appointments, <clears throat> OK? Now, we've all had some fantasies about, oh, thank god they didn't show up today. You know, I wish they didn't, you know. I mean, that's just kind of normal. We don't, you know. But if it's happening over and over with a specific client, if you find yourself wanting to take them home and take care of them and open a group home <laughs> or a shelter or, you know, um, you start thinking, well, this person, you know, I, you know, I could really be friends with them, and your boundaries start getting blurred, and maybe you do lunch, and maybe you take more calls with them than you would with somebody else, and it's not a clinical decision. It's kind of your boundaries are getting blurred. That's another example. Um, you begin to have consistent sexual fantasies and arousal by the specific client. Now, it's natural that we will have attraction to certain clients. We are human beings, OK? And we are sexual beings. If I have an attraction to a client, that's an issue for supervision. 
and that gets done and worked on in supervision. If I find that it's consistently there, that's something about me, and it also could be telling me something about the client, which is going to be in the following examples about how they use their sexuality for power and to hook me, possibly, because the whole piece of therapy is there's something called transference and countertransference, right? Okay. So if they are so used to be dealing with people with their sexuality, physically or emotionally, wouldn't it make sense you would be one more person they're going to try to do that with? Okay. So it's a, just another piece about boundaries. And it may be that you need to start talking about concretely what this relationship is about professionally and what's OK and what's not OK. Um, is that enough? I, I'm kind of running out of. Does anybody else have a question or comment before we move on? This piece. OK. So we were at power equals violation. And I wanted to give you some of the suggestions or recommendations of how to stay out of rescuer role. Rescuer role is a dangerous role for us to be in. Now, again, it's natural if we are adults working with children, we have that peace in us. We want to protect them. We want to save them. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's not about getting rid of that part. It's about acknowledging that and not getting caught into starting to play the fixer or God. And how do you do that? Well, this stuff is unconscious. So first part of an equation that I use is the equation is awareness plus action equals different result. Awareness plus action equals different result. This is the awareness part of the equation. If it's unconscious, I have to start becoming conscious of it. How do I become conscious that I'm even in the rescuer role? Number one is you showed up today and you're hearing some of this. And if you relate to any of it, it's a beginning for you of possibly invite, you know, looking at the places or uh, situations where you might fall into that rescuer role. Number two, you are in ongoing supervision no matter what, no excuses. Now, for the people who are not the clinicians, what is supervision? You are getting a peer group together of people who you respect, who you trust, who you can speak to. You can speak about slap therapy or wanting to slap. Or you could speak about, I don't know what to do in this case. Help me out. Give me suggestions. Okay? This client is reminding me of my mother, and I'm freaking out. I mean, whatever it is, that you can talk about it. You can debrief your trauma of working with them. You hire somebody who's walked before you, who you trust, who can do the same. And I really recommend that it's, if you're in an agency, that it's not somebody in your agency. Because then you have all this stuff about, am I going to be fired if I say this? Am I they going to look at me different? So if you hire somebody outside, you don't have any of that agenda going on. And you can be much freer to be who you are. Okay. Now, another statement. If I am not in ongoing supervision, and I am working with this population, I am practicing unethically. I feel really strongly about that. If I am not in ongoing supervision, I am practicing unethically. Just from this little scenario, you can see all the unconscious dynamics that happen for us and for the clients. And you can contaminate that work very quickly by being unconscious. That doesn't mean we're conscious or aware of every single thing we do, say, and think. It means we're on top of as much as we can, and we're consistently getting that help. Other is, so ongoing supervision. Be in your own therapy when that's necessary. You may not be a survivor or a thriver around childhood sexual abuse, but you're a human being who has experienced betrayal, probably abandonment in some way, shape, or form, hurt, loss, grief, pain. Your clients will trigger your own issues no matter what. That goes to supervision and or your own therapy. <coughs> the last part is to learn about and practice firm, realistic, consistent limits and boundaries. Firm, realistic, consistent limits and boundaries. This is part of the corrective emotional experience we want to provide, whether you're a clinician, a teacher, um, a CPS worker, a doctor, a victim advocate. Okay? In the experience of us, we want them to not be in 
helpless, vulnerable, unsafe, and out of control. We want them to be in the empowered place. This is a safe place. Okay? And boundaries are a big piece about creating safety. Very big piece. So we want corrective emotional experience, not reenactment and re-traumatizing. So the three ways to get out of the rescuer role, supervision, own therapy, boundaries. Next equation, sex equals power. If you buy it that power equals violation, we have three parts to sex equals power. The first is, if sex equals power and power equals violation, it would make sense that we'd see sexually violating behavior to self and others. We do. We see the compulsive masturbation sometimes to the point of injury. We will see sexually perpetrating acts to somebody else. Remember, 27% the kids. Okay. So sexu sexually violating self or others. It could be that I set myself up to be in sexually dangerous situations because I, my level of tolerance for danger, exploitation, and shame is very high due to my childhood experience. And I have this denial and delusion on board. And I think everything's OK, and then it happens again. How did this happen? Okay, Because they didn't see the red flags before it. That's how it happens. Second, not only do they have the victim glasses on, well, now they're putting the sex glasses on top of that. And they start to see the world through the sex lenses or sex filter. What does that mean? That means that they objectify people, places, and things, including themselves. Difficult to impossible to have sexual, to have relationships without the sexual energy or expectations present. Does that mean they have sex with everybody? No. It means they use their sexuality for power in the relationship. Now, I want you to think about something. When you're working with a kid, adolescent, or an adult, you're the professional. Who's got the power inherently in the relationship between you and them? You do. Okay. So there is a power differential when we work with anybody. And you also know if you're interviewing an adult, okay, chronologically they may be 50 years old. Emotionally, how old are they? Right. And so we're always working with kids. I mean, that's just a bait. We're always working with kids. So. Here we are, we're in the power and authority role. What's been their experience with people in the power and authority role? That these people violate them and violate them sexually. Okay. So what are they going to try to do? They're going to try to get power in the relationship so they don't get violated. So they may try to violate you. And you may hear things, and this is very subtle. You may hear very detailed things of their stories. Okay? Now everybody says, you know, you got to tell all the details. Well, maybe you do, maybe you don't. I even question that. Does somebody have to tell you every single little detail in order to heal? Question mark on that one. But you may be hearing details and details over and over again, and it feels slimy to you, and it feels violating to you. Okay? Because they could definitely use their story to perpetrate you. And I've seen that in group many times. People come in and use their story to perpetrate the group. Okay? It could be that they're being very seductive with you in terms of their clothing, in terms of their language. Um, they're coming up and hugging you and touching you a lot. I mean, it, expect them to be seductive. Expect them to use their sexuality to gain power. Expect them for the next equation, okay, which is not for everybody, but I would expect it that they're also going to equate sex with love. And if I'm not going to in, engage in flirting and intrigue and possibly even physical sexual acts with them, they're going to think I don't love them because that's how it's been hooked up for them. So this is a relearning experience for them. Relearning. So expect seduction. Be very, very direct and honest about touch. So we have to ask questions about touch. For example, what kind of touch happens in your family system or happened in your family system? Can you tell me about it? Can you draw about it? Can you write a poem about it? Can you show me? Whatever way. Okay. Have you ever been tickled to the point where you wet your pants or you, wanted, you said no, but it didn't stop? What kind of hugs did you get in your family? Did you get hugs in your family? What kind of touch felt good to you? What kind of touch felt yucky? What kind of touch felt scary? Did you ever have any touch that felt yucky and good at the same time? This is going to get you disclosures that you would not have gotten when 
when the question came out, have you been sexually abused? Okay. So let me be a tangent for just a second. Is the question, have you been sexually abused, is that a leading question? How many people say yes? How many people say no? How many people say, I abstain or it depends? <laughs> you can always win with that, OK? I abstain or it depends. With this question, it does depend. Is it the only form of abuse you ask about? If it is, then it's leading. Do you have a lot more energy about sexual abuse than you do if you ask about physical abuse or emotional abuse? If you do, it's leading. Okay. I encourage you to ask the question in some way, shape, or form, because if you don't, you are colluding with silence and denial. How many clients have, have come to me to say, nobody ever asked before? I've been in therapy 15 years, never talked about it. How come? Nobody ever asked. Be the one to ask. And a lot of the questions around touch are going to get you to that. Okay. I'm also very direct about my name is, this is my role, this is the professional relationship. It's kind of akin to kind of coaching maybe. Or, you know, I'm here to facilitate you. You're the one with all your answers. I don't have your answers. Okay. I'm here to facilitate you in getting to your truth and to learn some skills so that you can thrive and really enjoy your life instead of just hang on and survive the way that you've been doing. Okay. What's OK here? What's not OK here? What kind of language is OK here? What's not OK? What kind of touch is OK? What's not OK? We've modeled. I've modeled for people hugs, how to hug appropriately. Um, you know, Is it appropriate to hug after every session? That's a big question in Tucson. Everybody hugs, hugs and hugs and hugs. And, you know, coming from New York, we didn't hug in New York. I mean, if you got a handshake, it was a big deal. Everybody's hugging. Does it have to be that? I, I'm just like, process, process, process. Talk about it, draw about it. You're working with younger kids. You're going to see it in their play. You can ask them to draw it out for you and play it out for you and use all your tools, your experiential tools. Because our kids will not learn a lot from the verbal cognitive behavioral therapy. They will learn from the play, from the music, from the drama, from the movement. They're going to learn from that rather than from the cognitive behavioral. Last part of sex equals power is sexual anorexia. Sexual anorexia, the shutdown of sexual feelings and or behaviors. Shutdown of sexual feelings and or behaviors. So the sexual anorexic, and you're going to see people sexually anorexic, you know, adolescence and up. Okay? And they're going to say, what are you talking about? Sex has no power in my life. I don't think about it. I don't do it. Pay attention to the person who can't stop thinking about it and doing it. That's the one you have to pay attention to. Leave me alone. Okay. Well, there is something called sex addiction. Okay? And there's a, whether you believe in it or not, there's something called compulsive sexual behavior or sexual addiction. The addiction and trauma are about the extremes, another way that they're correlated. They're about the extremes. And so there are extremes of sexual addiction. One is the compulsive acting out, the fantasy, the behaviors of acting out and having that run my life. Sex very powerful here. There's the other end of the continuum of the extreme of sex is so powerful, I have to shut it down and avoid it in order to master it. That's the sexual anorexic. So we got the two extremes, and we got other stuff in the middle there. So are sexual feelings natural for human beings? What would you say? Yeah. Would you say they're powerful feelings? Yeah. Some people say they are God-given spiritual feelings. And if you are engaged physically, sexually with someone who you have that connection with, that very much can be a spiritual experience, that our sexuality and our spirit are so interlinked that we really can't even tell the difference. We are sexual beings. Okay. So how much energy do you think it takes to shut down such powerful natural feelings? You would think a lot, right? OK, so five second game with me. Five seconds, no thinking pink elephants. Ready? Go. No thinking pink elephants. OK, how many people did it? How many people did not think about pink elephants? Anybody? OK, I usually get one or two in the crowd, right? So several months ago, I get this guy, and he raises his hand. I said, sir, how'd you do it? He goes, very easy. I thought about sex. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> 
Most people say, I looked up at that red word incest, and I went, incest, 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 for five seconds. Okay. So what you had to do was you had to focus so narrowly on that word incest and really plug it in in order to not have those pink elephants in there, right? Right. Okay. So I want you to think about doing that every second of every minute of every hour of every day. Because that's what the sexual anorexic is doing about sexual feelings and behaviors. Okay? That is overwhelmingly powerful and it's running their life. But it doesn't overtly look like that. Okay. The other thing people do is dissociate. People have said in the crowd, well, I kind of left the room, went to the mountains, had my nice little nature walk for five seconds. Right. You left your body, you dissociated. Okay? So we do that also to deny and shut off those feelings. So sexual anorexia, and my experience with people, working with people with sexual anorexia is that it progresses. And it progresses into social phobia, where they have so much anxiety about connecting at all with other people. That it has nothing to do with sex anymore. It's about any kind of connection, which what happens? It takes them back to unsafe, out of control, helpless, and vulnerable. These oftentimes sexual abuse survivors cannot tell the difference between the now and the then. Because now might be very safe to talk with you, maybe even to engage in sexual behavior with you. But see, they can't tell the difference. They begin to do those things. They begin to feel sexual feelings. They go right back to helpless, vulnerable, unsafe, and out of control. How many people want to be there? They say, I don't want to be there. I don't want to go there. And the anorexic's way of dealing with things is more of the avoiding and the minimizing. The compulsive actor-outer is more of the acting out and being outside. So the anorexic says, I just shut it off. I don't deal with it. See, I don't have post-traumatic stress disorder. Well, what they don't know is that one of the main criteria for post-traumatic stress is avoiding the stimuli that remind you of the trauma. So here they are, avoiding the stimuli that remind them of the trauma. And they're feeling mastery and powerful over their abuse and helpless, vulnerable, unsafe, and out of control. Okay. But guess what? It's always there, frightening them. So do they have mastery that is long-lasting? No, they do not. It's consistent energy to try and master that. Okay. They are trying to meet safety and security needs. All of these behaviors we're talking about today meet basic human wants and needs. Power is a basic human want and need. Safety and security are basic human wants and needs. So they do know about sex and sexual feelings rather than being able to know they can have boundaries and say no and manage that. Is that making any sense at all? Okay. Book titled Sexual Anorexia came out about three years ago. Author is Patrick Carnes, C-A-R-N-E-S. Patrick Carnes is the, is the father of sexual addiction treatment and research. And if you don't know about him, please. There's three references, and he has even more books, three references in the handout. His initial book is called Out of the Shadows, Introduction to Sexual Addiction and Co-Sex Co Addiction, uh, which is the partner of. Okay. And Sexual Anorexia. And the other book that I'd really recommend that you get, uh, if, if there's going to be a book by Carnes, and it's not the Sexual Anorexia book, get either one of these. Get Out of the Shadows and or Betrayal Bonds. And of course, I recommend you read them all, but by the end of the seminar, you could have a stack of 25 or 30 that I could recommend to you and say, absolutely, when you leave here, you got to go and get them. And you say, oh, great, more money, overwhelm. I already have a stack of 20 or 30 by my bed that I haven't read yet, but you know, kind of getting there. I like the one that I put them on the shelf and I haven't read them, but it looks like I did, so it looks good. Because <laughs> it's all about looking good. And I tell clients, it's not how you feel, it's how you look. It's important. <laughs> OK. So we get to laugh about that. Oh, I have, to t I have to tell you this, too. We did, in group last Sunday, we did the ultimate victim contest. I love that game. And what does that do? It's a paradoxical intervention. OK. 
okay? The, the, the theme in the group was uh, it's all about victim role. And so I told them, and I said, we're going to have the ultimate victim contest. I want you to really slap it on, and we're going to vote about who could be the best victim. They had such a ball with that. We were laughing hysterically. And we did some really powerful work after that around coming out of that role and being assertive and what does that look like. And so it was a, a really wonderful, humorous way for them to switch it a little bit. OK. Yeah, sexual anorexia. That's all I want to say about that, I think. Next, sex equals love. Not for everybody, but remember majority of reported cases, child sexual abuse in this country, perpetrated by somebody the kid knows, loves, and trusts. Majority of the cases are not about knives, binding, gagging, bleeding, tearing, ripping, overt violence. Okay? Most cases not about overt violence, which makes it much harder to have conclusive evidence. Most of it is covert violence around manipulation and coercion. That's the violation of trust, the manipulation and coercion and the violation of that power differential. So we have an example of a seven-year-old girl. She's growing up in a family where mom has manic depressive illness. Now this little girl does not know from manic depressive illness. What she knows is mommy is real predictable and how unpredictable she is because mommy doesn't take medication. Now, a lot of times, mommy's not feeling very good, and mommy's doing one of two things. Mommy is either in bed, doesn't get out of bed, and so the kids have to fend for themselves. Or mommy's out of bed, the kids wish she went back to bed because she's yelling, screaming, and hitting them. So they're getting neglected, or they're getting overt physical abuse and verbal abuse. Then once in a while, mommy's got a smile on her face, and they have fun. So what would we know that as? We would know that as mom's intermittent manic phase. And what do we know about intermittent reinforcement? It's the most powerful form. Okay. Do you know how many millions of dollars they pay these marketing consultants to find out how many jackpots they have to, have to happen in the casinos for people to keep going cha-ching, cha-ching? Millions and millions of dollars. It's like we have, do you guys have Powerball here? OK. So I look up at the board whenever I drive by, right? I look up and I see, you know, 280 million. Remember that one a couple weeks ago? So I'm thinking, this is really cool because I'll buy like three tickets and I will have a great chance to win. Because every ticket gives me 50% chance to win. Doesn't it? I'm either going to win or I'm not, right? It's 50%. <laughs> and then I get really pissed off when I don't win. And then I'm told, well, you, you have a better chance of getting hit by lightning four times in your life than you do winning the Powerball. Okay? Denial again. Don't even know I am lying. I don't know. So intermittent reinforcement, very powerful. What happens? Well, here's a day when mommy had a smile on her face. They had energy and they had fun. And it's now about 7 o'clock. It's time for bath. Mommy says to the little girl, I just love you so much, and I know you love me, and I want to show you how much I love you, and I know you want to show me how much you love me. She begins to fondle the little girl in the bathtub. Doesn't that feel good, honey? I just love you so much. Didn't we have fun today? And if you loved me, you would do the same to me and make mommy feel good. Well, there's a part of the seven-year-old over here that says, I do love mommy. This was a great day. My most important need, right? is to be connected and bonded with my mom. Okay. And I do love her so much, and I want to show her that I love her. And I hope, this, I hope she keeps smiling, and I want to make her keep smiling, because I hate the other stuff that happens. And then there's another part of her that says, yeah, but this is kind of yucky. I don't think I want mommy to touch me here, and I don't think I want to do that to her. This part says, shut up. Mom ups the ante, coerces her into oral sex back and forth. Doesn't that feel good, honey? I just love you so much. And if you love me, you do the same to me. There's the part of her that says, ooh, there's stuff happening in my body. I don't even know what this is. But mommy's telling me it's love. So this must be love, the feeling of love. And she wants me to, I love her. So I'm going to do the same so she gets that same feeling. This part of her says, oh, this is really yucky, and I'm really scared, and I, I don't want to do this, and please make this stop. Shut up. Three or four critical things happen in that moment. One is dissociation. Can she, at seven years old, in an isolated system, 
Can she hold both realities that mom, she loves mom, and mom is good, and what's happening here ain't OK, and mom is abusing her? She can't. Cannot hold that. How many adults can hold that? You get an adult rape victim, what's the first thing they say? What did I do to make this happen? OK? So they can't even, they, so she, she can't hold, what does she do? She dissociates, she splits off the terror or fear and the fact that what mom is doing is yucky. She splits it off. Does it poof go into thin air? No. It changes form and how does it get integrated into her belief system? By her believing now, I am yucky for participating in and liking this. I am yucky for participating in and liking this. That is called toxic shame. Mom has acted shamelessly. If she had an appropriate amount of shame on board, she would not violate her daughter the way that she did. Okay? An appropriate amount of shame and guilt triggers me to say, boundaries. Okay? Mom didn't have that. So that shame got passed on to her daughter in a toxic way. I am yucky. I am bad. I am unlovable. I am a mistake. Very common sexual abuse survivor shame statements. I am bad, yucky, unlovable, a mistake. One little boy we worked with said he had a devil inside of him. How come? Because that's what he was told by his perpetrator who happened to be a clergy person. Now this is not about blaming clergy or anything like that. But to see how sometimes religious stuff gets in with the sexual abuse and really confuses <coughs> and scares our kids. Okay. So I am bad, dirty, unlovable, yucky. So we have toxic shame. John Bradshaw, you probably remember John Bradshaw, said the only amount of shame we need is to know that we're not God. Rest of it is toxic. Okay. Then we have a gentleman called Colin Ross who is one of my favorite people. Colin Ross is a psychiatrist and expert in dissociative disorders and childhood trauma. The book I'd recommend from Colin Ross came out in January, and it's called The Trauma Model. It's not in your bibliography yet, because we're still updating. But it's called The Trauma Model, Colin Ross, C-O-L-I-N-R-O-S-S. -S -S. Colin Ross is the clinical director of three different inpatient programs for people who have severe dissociative disorders. One is in Texas, and there's a reference for his institute in Texas. He's also a consultant clinical director at the Lamo Hospital in Los Angeles. And he's also Grand Ra Charter Hospital in Grand Rapids, Michigan, has a dissociative disorders unit that he is also director for. And what he talks about in his trauma model is whether it's sexual abuse, whatever form of abuse, he believes there is a crux, a, a core dynamic that's going on. And he calls it attachment to the perpetrator and the locus of control shift. Okay. So with this example, you see that this little girl needs to be attached to her mom, correct? That's her most basic need. As mammals, we have to connect and attach to a major caregiver in order to survive. Would you agree with that, biologically? Yeah. Human infant does not connect or bond with a major caregiver, what happens? You get failure to thrive and or you get attachment disorder. All right. So they have to attach or bond. First year and a half of a kid's life, psychosocial development wise, is called the attachment phase, isn't it? Right. So attachment is a big piece. So this little girl has to attach to this mom who's hurting her. Pretty double, double bind, right? Confusing, crazy making. So what happens? Well, she can't handle that in her, in her psyche. And so she does that split off, and she makes mom all good, and she makes her all bad so that she can handle it. Because here's the all good mom. I'm attached must be something about me. This way, I have an illusion and delusion of control, because it's all about me. And if I could just do something different, if I could just be a good boy or a good girl, then it would be different. That's an illusion or delusion of control. The reality is, she's totally powerless over this. It's about mom and her behavior. But she can't get that at seven years old. She would, it would be like psychic death for her. Now, there are some miracles, and some kids know these people are crazy, and I just have to live here till I get out of here. 
Okay? Those are few and far between. Most of the kids are going to, you're all good, I'm all bad. What happens? Then they start to be in relationships and reenact that. And they start to hang out with people and attach to people who hurt them. Sound like domestic violence in adulthood? I mean, this is, this is the reenactment pattern. Okay. So Colin Ross says, attachment to the perpetrator, locus of control shift. Instead of mom's accountable for this, now I am accountable for this. I believe it also keeps people alive. Because if I'm a kid and I have this illusion of control, I'll hang out here another 24 hours and see if it changes. If not, well, the next 24 hours. Literally helping our kids to survive until they get help. Okay. Bless you. Then you have another piece with that that's called developmental arrest. She's seven years old. She is developmentally on target, narcissistic, egocentric, has magical thinking. Everything happens about me. It's all about me, right? Everything revolves about, around me. Then I ask you the question, how many of us really grow out of that? I don't know. But at seven years old, it's developmentally appropriate. OK. So there she is. So of course she's going to make it about her. What happens? Well, she gets arrested at the stage of development that she was at when she was abused, the stage or phase. And so at, she's got the seven-year-old thinking in there. I am yucky for participating in and liking this. If she doesn't get intervention, she's in your office at 50 years old, and she's saying to you, I am yucky for participating in and liking this. And you're going, you're 50. Didn't you grow out of that yet? Didn't you know you were seven? You couldn't have done it because your mother was this. Blah, blah, blah. No, I'm different. Like she might know that about other kids, other people, but not her. She's different. It's called terminal uniqueness. Okay, which is another part of that, all these terms, uh, another part of that egocentric, narcissistic, self-centered way of thinking, which is developmentally appropriate for a kid. Okay, and it's pretty much human. I mean, that's what I want. It's pretty much human. So a lot of things here. We had dissociation. We have attachment to the perpetrator, locus of control shift. We have developmental arrest. We have toxic shame. Okay. Can you see how this little seven-year-old would begin to mistake sex for love? Yeah. Her physical sexual arousal gets hooked up with thinking that that is love. All right. All right. Okay. Last equation. Anger equals rage. Not going to say much about this right now because I'm going to talk to you more about it this afternoon. What I want to say right now is I don't think they're equal to each other. Anger is one of the many feelings that make up rage in my book. And I'll present that to you later. Oftentimes, what survivors grow up with, however, is somebody gets angry, somebody gets hurt. What they've seen is raging behavior where somebody does get hurt. So they grow up thinking, well, I don't want to be like this person, so I'm just not going to feel anger. And if I just don't feel anger, then I won't be like them. Everything's fine. Okay. Look out for this. This is a major survival skill right here. So they're smiling. It's not about, OK, my therapeutic assignment to you is to never smile again. No. It's about I do wondering and noticing. So I'm noticing you're smiling when you're playing this with the dolls, and it's a very aggressive thing. You're smiling. Tell me more about what that's about. Tell me more about that great non-leading statement you can always use and get away with. Tell me more about that. Okay? Notice putting the mirror up, very important. I'm noticing this in your body language. I'm noticing this with a smile. I'm wondering what it would be like for you for just five, for five seconds, and I'll time it, to not smile and to do that activity or to say that sentence one more time. What am I doing? I am allowing them to step in to some feelings, and they can come right back out. Because when they don't have that smile, some feelings are going to start to surface. It's very scary for them. Okay? So we do it five seconds, very little, take them out. Colin Ross calls it desensitizing to the core grief around all this. Okay? So we are desensitizing people. We're letting them in a little bit, take them out. So they're empowered. They know they're not going to go crazy. How many times have you heard, I'm going to lose it, I'm going to kill somebody, I'm going to kill myself. There's so much in there that there's no way I could ever handle it. 
It's so overwhelming for them, all the emotions. So we take them in a little bit, take them out. Okay. Colin Ross says that the core work, emotional work around childhood sexual abuse is grief work. So we are all grief specialists in here. Whether you knew it or not, you're a bereavement counselor. Okay. You are working with loss, significant losses. Significant losses. Okay, and I'm going to say this and then we'll take, our, we'll take our break. The core grief is not all the bad things that happen to you that you have to tell me every detail about. The core grief is the good stuff that didn't happen to you that you didn't get that was your birthright. The core grief is the good stuff that you didn't get that was your birthright. 